Welcome to episode four of Will's Guide. This year I've decided to make 1,024 videos. I've upped the number from 1,000 because I think two to the tenth or one kilo tube of videos is more fun. I've also set up the Discord server. We've had about a dozen people join. If you're interested in joining the Discord server, the imperishable wonderland of infinite fun, please email me. Today, I'd like to talk about something close to my heart, Scheme, a language which I love. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how you might learn Scheme. I'm going to have a whole bunch of videos on Scheme, I hope. But how do you learn about Scheme? You know, what are the resources available? Let me just talk about a few of them I found useful. One is called The Little Schemer by Daniel P. Friedman and Matthias Fleissen. Dan was my advisor at Indiana University for PhD, and he was also Matthias' uh, advisor. And you also might know Matthias from the racket world. So you have two experts guiding you. This book is really about thinking computationally and specifically thinking about recursion, recursion over lists and trees, those sorts of things, and also a little interpreter work. So if you think this is going to be a book that's a big, thick manual on Scheme, the programming language, and the semantics or whatever, well, you might be disappointed. But this really, in another way, is at the heart of thinking about Scheme computationally and thinking about computation and recursion. So it's a great book to affect your thinking and make sure that you're really comfortable with ideas about recursion. So this is recommended by me. If you want to learn how to think recursively, at least a certain way of thinking recursively, if you're not comfortable with recursion, if you read this book, and if you learn Scheme in general, you're likely to become very comfortable with recursion because Scheme is really based on recursion. There's no loop constructs like there are in most languages, or anything does look like a loop, it's actually tail recursion, which we'll talk about later. So sort of the secret that Scheme doesn't really have loops in the way most languages do. Although it turns out you can implement loops that are equivalent to a certain type of recursion. Another great resource is the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs by Harold Abelson and Gerald J. Sussman with Julie Sussman. This is very famous as maybe the greatest textbook in the history of computer science. It was used as the introductory textbook at MIT for many years. It has all sorts of interesting ideas about computation and interpreters, how to write interpreters. Interpreters, how you write a program that interprets another program. Those sorts of ideas. Computational models. Great book, full of deep, fascinating ideas. Once again, not a manual on Scheme. Scheme is introduced as needed as a computational notation, which really gets back to the heart of Lisp, the Lisp family of languages. You, know, you need to have some sort of notation to talk about computation. So let's have a very elegant, simple, minimal notation that's compositional, has nice properties, and we can think about. That's at the heart of Scheme, and that's one reason I really like Scheme. There's a series of videos based on the ideas in the books called the SICP lectures. And if you're interested in the book, you might like these videos. I will say that the videos can be in the book can be a little mathy, especially in terms of the examples. Um, you know, they're aimed towards the MIT, you know, entering class or, you know, in this case, um, you know, for these lectures, I don't know if these are supposed to be more experienced programmers or if, or whatever, but, um, you know, it, it can turn people off a little bit. So if you find that this is a little hard going, maybe start with something like the little schemer first, which is really written for the bright high school student, but the ideas are very deep and powerful and can, you know, can benefit anyone. Uh, so maybe start with something like the little schemer. And if you feel that's not enough, you could try the reason schemer, which is a much harder book. Um, but in any case, you could build yourself up towards the ideas in SICP over time. There's a follow-on book, intellectually, a follow-on book 
called Software Designed for Flexibility, How to Avoid Programming Yourself into a Corner by Chris Hansen and Gerald J. Sussman. This is metaphorically the advanced version or the advanced follow-up of structure interpretation computer programs. It's really about how do you write software? How do you write complicated programs in such a way that if you want to make a significant change to the program, you don't have to throw away all your code and start over again? It turns out to be quite tricky. So the book uses a bunch of techniques people in the Scheme and Lisp community and AI communities have developed over a long period of time to make software more flexible. Okay, so it's full of really interesting techniques. We should probably talk about that at some point. Once again, not a book on Scheme, but it contains a lot of really advanced uses of Scheme. You can learn a lot by looking at this book. If you want something maybe closer to a traditional textbook, there's simply Scheme by Brian Harvey and Matthew Wright. Now, you could see the second edition is from 1999. So it's you know quarter of a century old, Scheme has changed, so forth. But the basic ideas will be similar. So there, there are some other introductory textbooks on Scheme. You'll find most of them are kind of out of date in terms of the specific language features. But the important thing is how you think about the language. You can learn about the new um, variants of Scheme over time. There are also a bunch of papers that you can, you can find on Scheme. There's a Scheme and Functional Programming Workshop it's been held for a number of years, you know, since 2000. Um, hopefully, there'll be a 2024 one happening soon. I'm on the steering committee for this workshop, and I've organized it uh, several times. So if you look at one of these workshops, like from last year, you can find the program and the accepted papers and, you know, this sort of thing. You know, so here's a preprint and... You find this is a recorded talk on um, designing a language for learning continuations. You can find the video online. You know, lots of lots of good resources there. You know, this is going to be more advanced, of course, than a textbook. But this is where a lot of the ideas get percolated or, or more like disseminated through the community is through papers or researchers talking to each other. If you don't have access to researchers talking to each other, if you're not in grad school, if you're not a working academic, if you're not a scheme implementer, then reading papers is probably the best thing to do. Certainly one of the best things to do. Now, because of the internet and the web, there are lots and lots of videos you can watch. You can learn things that way as well. And of course, communicate with people via forums and all the amazing things that we have now. Uh, speaking of forums, you know, there's Lambda the Ultimate, the programming languages weblog, which used to be more active. I don't know to what extent it's active these days, but there's a, a period in time where this was a really important resource for people trying to understand functional programming. And there's a group of papers here called the Lambda the Ultimate Papers, where the website got its name. And you know, so Lambda, the ultimate imperative, for example. Uh, I don't know what will happen if I try opening that. Let's see. How about that one? Yeah, let's try it. Uh, I have no idea. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, these are papers with Guy Steele and Jerry Sussman, these, the original Lambda, the ultimate papers. Lambda, the ultimate X. And these are papers that were describing Scheme and using Scheme or using Lisp to solve different types of problems and looking at Lisp or Scheme from different perspectives. So these are classic papers. Introduction, Lambda Calculus. Okay, Go-To Statement Considered Harmful by Dijkstra. Whole bunch of interesting papers, Essence of Compiling Continuations. So, you know, these are uh, classic papers in functional programming and programming languages that are worth taking a look at. And many of these are involving Scheme or some version of Lisp. 
There's also this scheme.org website. There at least used to be a website called Read Scheme. I don't know if that still exists, but you know, Scheme's been around long enough that websites uh, come and go. The scheme.org website seems to have lots of lots of useful resources. Uh, and you can see that there are different standards and implementations and so forth. Great. Things about community. Books. Here is a scheme bibliography on GitHub. And this lists all sorts of uh, Lambda papers and papers on macros. Well, maybe it doesn't. Fail. What's going on here? I don't know. Like I said, Scheme's been around a long time, so I don't know why these things aren't working. Let's see, is that open? Okay, here we go. Maybe it's just a bad link. Maybe it's just a bad link. So, you know, there are lots and lots of papers on different topics like reflection. You know, a bunch of really interesting papers on reflection and scheme. Um, and we'll talk about those too. All right. Another way, if you really want to learn scheme, is to start looking at the standards like R5RS. That's the revised, 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 revised report on the algorithmic language scheme. So there's this tradition of having revised, repeated a bunch of times. So R6RS, add one more revise at the beginning, so it'd be revised to the sixth power. R7RS, which is standards currently being developed, has revised to the seventh power. So that's, uh, if you hear people talk about R5, R6, R7, they might just call it R6. Uh, they're talking about different versions of the scheme specification standard. Um, R5RS was the standard that was in place when I started uh, graduate school and when I started studying Scheme in a serious way. Normally, you hear about people talking about R4RS, R5RS, R6RS, R7RS. R7RS is broken into two parts, a large and a small. But those are the standard things you hear about. So if someone's talking about R5RS Scheme, that's what they're referring to. They're referring to that version of Scheme, and you can get the report, which is pretty short. It's 50 pages long. This is a beautiful document, the R5 document. Oh, I love it. One of my favorite documents in computation. And, you know, it has an index. It has a denotational semantics, which has some problems. Um, but, you know, it contains a complete semantics for the programming language and an index and descriptions of the core features of language and the syntax and all that, and examples. And the whole thing's 50 pages long. So you can read 50 pages. It's not that long. There'll be things you don't understand, but there'll be lots of things you do understand because it's written actually very well. And if you you know, take a, a scheme interpreter or a scheme compiler and you try going through the examples with your scheme compiler, you can get a lot of mileage just from reading through this document. More recently, there's the revised, 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 I think I got that right, report on the algorithmic language scheme, revised to the sixth power, or R6RS. And you can find on r6rs.org um, different versions of the specification. Now for R6, they broke up the specification into both the language specification and the standard libraries. So this is a bigger version of Scheme, significantly bigger than R5 RS. It's somewhat controversial that it was so big. Now, compared to a language like Java, it's tiny, but it's still much bigger than R5, which was bigger than R4. And there are some people in the Scheme community who love the tiny, tiny, tiny core language that's easy to implement easy to teach, easy to understand. And there's some people who want a pragmatic, practical language for everyday programming, practical tasks. They want a bigger language. R6, you know, they found something of a middle ground and that didn't make everyone happy. Maybe it made no one happy, but that was the approach taken for R6. And so they broke the standard libraries into a different document. 
And they also have these non-normative appendices and rationale. This is great if you want to understand how a language is designed. So this is a discussion about why they did certain things. Okay, so not only is there a, a specification, and in this case, a different type of semantics, which I believe is uh, operational semantics, but they also talk about why they made these decisions. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, now, you know, if you want to, you know, uh, get your hands on a specification and understand it, what I probably would recommend is starting with R5, just because it's so small. R5, RS doesn't really describe things like hygienic macros in a lot of depth. And there are some things that, you know, are frankly mistakes in or, or oversights in the spec. So I wouldn't say that this is the final word, even for the R5 version. However, it's so small and it's so well written that I think it's a great way to get a handle on what a spec looks like. Or you could just dive into R6. Um, but just be aware that the uh, this is a bigger language and, and specifies a lot more. And, you know, this libraries part is large as well. So, uh, okay. And then there's an R7, which I was talking about, which is still being developed. There's a small language and a large language. So, like I said, there was some controversy over R6RS because it was a bigger standard than R5. And yet it didn't include things like threads, didn't include lots of information about dealing with the operating system and, you know, the web. So uh, people who wanted to use Scheme as uh, a teaching language or as a, a language where they could easily hack up an implementation and play around with ideas that way, some of those people weren't so happy with R6 because it was bigger and complicated and more complicated than R5, harder to implement, harder to teach. And at the same time, people who wanted to do web programming, let's say, uh, or create a video game and scheme and interact with graphics or whatever uh, complicated thing they wanted to do, they weren't happy because R6RS didn't specify that. But what R6RS did specify was a library system where people could at least, in theory, write code that could be uh, modularized and maybe ported between different implementations. Before R6RS, there really wasn't a chance to port code easily between scheme implementations. So R6 was a step in that direction. In R7, it's a reaction to some extent, I think, against R6, where they say, okay, let's have a small language for the people who want a tiny jewel-like gem of a language that's easy to implement, easy to understand. They can hack it to their heart's contempt for uh, you know, programming languages, research, or whatever they want to do. They can have the so small language. And for the people who want to have a really big language, they have the big language. So they split up the spec, which is an interesting idea. What's happened in practice is that the small language design was completed in 2013. The large language design is still going on. So 11 years after the small um, language was finished. And I guess this was sort of a, you know, almost a guaranteed outcome when you're trying to make a much bigger version of the language um, that's not supported by a bunch of industry, you know, and, and government research uh, labs or whatever. So um, this, this spec is still going on. You will see for any individual scheme implementation, it's likely to say which version of the spec is supported. They support R4 RS, they support R5, R6, R7, R7 small. Nothing supports R7 large completely because that spec is still being developed. Shea scheme, um, currently supports R6RS. Uh, and even for something like R6RS or R5RS, you'll often see that an individual specification, or sorry, individual implementation will describe differences from the spec. So in fact, for some versions of the specification, the, the specification itself is internally inconsistent and it's impossible to implement. 
a, a correct version, or at least people have made that argument, that it's impossible to create a fully conforming implementation. Um, also, there are some subtleties in the spec that you know make it a little bit of a design and implementation trade-off to decide to implement every single thing in the spec. So many implementations will say they are they implement R in RS, whatever N is, um, modulo this one little feature, what have you. Okay. So those are the the language specs. And it's really important if you're going to use Scheme or any other language to be comfortable with the definition of the language, I think. Nice thing about Scheme is the the, the specification is actually pretty small. If you want to learn C++ or Java, those specifications are quite complicated. Although C++, they seem to be um, maybe simplifying. Uh, Java still seems to be getting more complicated in a way, although they are adding abstractions that hopefully are helpful. Okay, another way to learn about Scheme is to read this book. This is a book I refer to all the time, which is called The Scheme Programming Language, 4th edition by Kent Divig, who's the creator of Shea Scheme, and who also was the editor of R6RS, uh, that spec. And so this is describing in the 4th edition, um, you know, basically R6RS scheme. But instead of describing it in a very formal way, it is describing scheme, you know, from the standpoint of examples and motivation and uh, gives just gives a lot more detail. So this is, you know, it's, it's not it's not really a textbook or tutorial, although it has aspects of that. Um, you know, if you didn't know how to program at all, I think this would be a hard book to learn programming from. But it's a great book to go to to try to understand what the specification is trying to say. So if there's part of R6RS that's complicated, or you just don't know about a feature at all, if you read about it in this book, and then look at the spec, then look at R6RS, then that will give you a much better idea of what's going on. And since Kent you know, was um, the editor for, for the R6RS process, he understands what the motivation was. And he's also an implementer. So he knows inside and out not just the motivation from the specification process, but how at least Shea Scheme implements um, those parts of the language, or at least how, how Shea Scheme implemented it when he wrote this book. Very, very useful resource. The book's very well written. Another companion guide that goes with that is the Shea Scheme user's guide. So like I said, Kent Divig is the creator of Shea Scheme and he has a user's guide, which now uh, I guess other people have contributed um, maybe to this guide. Certainly originally, I think this was written by Kent and it ties to the Scheme Programming Language book. These are cross-referenced with each other. Very helpful. So if you're using Shea Scheme, which is um, the implementation along with Racket that I use most often, of, of scheme or scheme like language, then this is a very helpful guide. And because it cross references with this uh, book talking about R6 RS, you can learn a lot about the language, the spec, and about how Shea does things and where Shea differs from the specification. So, two really useful resources. One thing that's changed since when I started grad school, let's say, at Indiana, was that Shea Scheme, which has always been known as a high-quality scheme implementation, used to be commercial software that you had to pay an expensive license to be able to run. Uh, Cisco ended up purchasing Shea Scheme and getting um, Kent and other Shea hackers uh, to work with them on a project for a number of years. So you can see that this user's guide is actually from Cisco, and Cisco eventually released Shea Scheme version 9 as open source software under an open source license. So now you can run the full version of Shea Scheme, the full compiled version, whereas before you could only use the interpreter. And Shea Scheme is now available 
on GitHub. So I use Shea Scheme a lot and will be using Shea Scheme in at least some of these videos. And so here you can see the cisco.github.io, you know, Shea Scheme um, page. And you can see that there's Git Shea Scheme documentation, all that sort of thing. Great. Now, last night when I was preparing for a video or um, preparing to make a bunch of videos, I started going through some of this documentation in the Shea Scheme uh, guide. And I, in particular, I wanted to learn how to use the Shea Scheme debugger better. Shea Scheme has an integrated debugger. It also has tracing facilities, all sorts of nice features, but I've never really been comfortable using debugger, partly because when I was in grad school, the debugger didn't work that well because I only had access to the interpreter, not the compiler. The debugger really is much better if you have the compiler for a Shea Scheme, which I have access to now because it's open source. So I wanna go back and learn about the debugger. When I was reading the debugging section, I noticed that, well, probably because this was written 10, 10 or more years ago, maybe 15 years ago now, uh, there's this dead link to how to debug Shea Scheme programs. Fortunately, someone has, uh, you know, found Kent's instructions on how to debug Shea Scheme programs, and you can find it online uh, for GitHub. And I found some other little typos. I think this is a typo. Trace let may be used to trace ordinary let expressions as well as let expressions. That I think is a typo. I don't know, a little confused. Here's something, looks like a copy and paste. Error box inspector objects. Ba box inspector objects contain Shea Scheme boxes, okay. And then TLC inspector objects. Box inspector objects contain Shea Scheme boxers, boxes. That looks like a copy and paste error to me. And uh, I didn't even know, by the way, what a TLC inspector object was. I'd never heard of that. It looks like that's coming from this paper um, my friend Aziz Gulome and Kent wrote on um, generation-friendly EQ hash tables. So in scheme EQ is pointer equality. Generation-friendly has to do with generational garbage collection. I mean, we talk about that. Um, but it turns out that these TLC things are temp transport link cells. I've never heard of that term before. Um, has to do with the way they implement these hash tables. So this documentation is a transport link cell inspector object. I think there's just a little copy and paste mistake. And uh, I think I found one or two other typos. Because Shea Scheme is now you know, open source and you can find um, not just the code for Shea Scheme, but also the Shea Scheme user's guide. And along with that, you know, the Scheme Programming Language 4th Edition, all these files are here. We can go and we can look at the debug, um, which is like a Scheme version of tech, I believe, that Kent came up with. So this is like a Scheme tech. And it turns out that, sure enough, uh, these typos, what I believe are typos are or old URLs, are in the documentation. And I don't know if Kent still maintaining this or not, but there are people still working on Shea Scheme, and, and in particular, the Racket people are rebuilding. They've rebuilt Racket on top of Shea, so they're active in keeping Shea up to date. And then some of the people who worked on Shea at Cisco, like Andy Keep, are, are still you know, keeping an eye on it and making updates. So I emailed Andy to ask, um, what should I do? Should I do a pull request or you know, send him or someone else, the typos I've found. So that, especially when you're part of a small community, but you're reading books as well, is a service that I think is important. So not only, you know, do you hopefully uh, feel comfortable reading specifications and reading formal documentation, reading books, but if you find an error, it's really helpful to the authors if you could report that error somehow. So that's what I'm going to do to try to be a good citizen in uh, the Shea Scheme world, to try to report these little 
uh, typos. Uh, you know, there's nothing here I couldn't easily understand, so I don't think it's a any sort of deep error. But let's go ahead and you know try to correct all those. So if you're reading documentation and you think something's an error, now if you don't know the language well, if you don't know the documentation well, then maybe it's hard to tell. So maybe ask someone else first. But if you're pretty sure it's just a typo, maybe go ahead and email the person who created it or send a pull request. And that's one way we can try to make these languages and documentation and tutorials, books uh, better over time. So that is just a quick overview of some resources for learning Scheme and you know, the importance, I think, of learning speci you know, from the uh, official specification, trying to read those. The Scheme spec is very short. So if you're interested in Scheme, I recommend maybe starting with R5 or just starting with R6. You could do R7 small and trying to trying to read those specs. You could read all of them if you if you're really into it. Trying to see how far you can get understanding it. And in the intro to R5, and I don't know how how old this intro is, there's this marvelous philosophical statement about the design of scheme, how the, the philosophy behind schemes design. You know, and in particular, I love this sentence. Programming languages should be designed not by piling feature on top of feature, but by removing the weaknesses and restrictions that make additional features appear necessary. Mm, I love it. Scheme demonstrates that a very small number of rules for forming expressions with no restrictions on how they are composed suffice to form a practical and efficient programming language that is flexible enough to support most of the major programming paradigms in use today. Oh, a very strong sense of design. I love it. This is very different from, say, the design of Java. Okay, very different. Um, so it's interesting when you're learning languages or thinking about languages to compa you know, compare and contrast the philosophies of the language. And as, as the languages change over time, are they, you know, uh, are, are they keeping up with this philosophy or are they changing somehow? I think... Certainly through R5, Scheme had this philosophy. Some people, I think, said that R6 maybe went too far away from being this minimum language with the smallest number of features. R7 small is more like this philosophy. Whether or not the larger versions are more useful, that's an interesting question. In any case, um, I hope you will take a look at the R5 report and see if you can make sense of that. Parts of it are very easy to read. Parts of it are kind of complicated. And if you're not familiar with denotational semantics, well, it's going to be really hard to read. If uh, you don't know anything about hygienic scheme macros, it's going to be hard to read. But we can talk about some of those topics in these videos. All right. See you soon. i got 1,020 videos to make. Bye-bye.